Yeah, sure. I, I think the concerns will change um, as I get closer to the start line and certainly as I get onto the race. But right now, my biggest concern is um, getting my boat ready, you know, getting it really well prepared. And there are two factors with this, and one of them is time, and the other one is money. And, of course, the more money you have, the quicker you can get things done and the sooner you can order equipment and stuff. Um, and the less money you have, the more time it takes to get the things that you need. So um, this is really my biggest concern is uh, that I will be able to raise enough funds to actually see this project through right to the start line. And I'm very confident that I will, but this is one of my big stresses right now. Welcome to my Resonora podcast. In English, you can translate it as Resonant Tide. My name is Marina Guedes. I'm a Brazilian journalist who crew on a sailboat in the South Pacific Islands for the last four years. I'm super happy to present this series with a very cool sailor from South Africa. Her name is Kirsten Neuchefer. She has great stories sailing in the Southern Oceans, and next year she will participate in the Golden Globe Race. That's right. Also known as GGR, this race is really unique, and you'll find out more about it through our guest today. Um, so today I have the pleasure to talk to Kirsten Neuchefer. I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. I need you to so, yeah, teach it's me. It's um, Neuchefer. Neuchefer. So Kirsten Neuchefer. Perfect. Okay, welcome on board, and it's a real cool pleasure to, to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for saying yes to my invitation. Well, thank you for having me on board. Uh, I appreciate you all taking interest. So tell me first, how and where are you exactly, Kirsten? At the moment, I'm on Prince Edward Island, Canada, um, and I'm busy refitting my Cape George 36 boat for the Golden Globe race in 2022. And I was curious about the name, the meaning of your boat's name, Ma Ni, the, the way to say it's Minehaha. How, what does that mean exactly? Um, well, I bought the boat with the name Minehaha, and I haven't changed it at this stage, uh, and I'm not sure I will change it unless someone wants to take a title sponsorship and decide what the name should be. But it's actually, it comes from um, some poetry, higher water. It's poetry about um, so, sort of uh, First Nation uh, North American uh, poetry. And it's uh, Minahaha was higher water's girlfriend in the poetry. But the, the, um, it's a Dakota language word, Minahaha, and it means laughing or rapid water. So like a waterfall or something. And Pretty much. Uh, that's so cool. And uh, what exactly, what type of, uh, is the boat that you're going to participate on the Go Golden Globe race next year? Can you describe a little bit about her, please? Sure. Yeah. So um, it's a Cape George 36. Uh, it was built in, um, in the U.S. in Washington State. And um, it was built in the 80s and it was launched in 1988. And it's a classic kind of boat with a long keel and the rudders hang on the keel. It's a fiberglass boat, and it's um, 36 feet. And all these things are prerequisites for um, the type of boat you can use in the race. So there are a number of pre-approved boats that you can use uh, for the race, and um, uh, you can only use any one of these boats because what they're trying to do is they're trying to standardize the type of boat that you use so that uh, you, you pretty much at the same kind of advantages uh, in racing against the other competitors. But one of the key things is that the um, type of boat needs to date back to the 1968 era because that's when the first Golden Globe race happened. And it's a retro race, so things need to kind of be true to that that time of, yeah, the 1960s. And what are, cool. And what are the other characteristics of this type of race, Kirsten? Well, uh, so with it being a retro race, uh, you're not allowed um, any modern electronics. So you're only allowed to use what was available back in 1968, uh, which is very limited. Uh, VHF uh, communication existed by, back then, so you're allowed a VHF. Um, uh, SSB communication existed, so you're allowed an SSB. You're not allowed GPS because GPS did not exist in 1968. So you have to do celestial navigation 
and dead reckoning to uh, know where you're going and where you are. Um, and you're not allowed an electronic autopilot because that didn't exist. So you're allowed a wind vane, which is a mechanical device uh, that will steer your boat according to a wind angle. So uh, you're not allowed a water maker. Um, you're not allowed radar. You're not allowed, you know, any navigational apps. You're not even allowed to have a computer or a, a smartphone or anything like that on board. So no such a thing as uh, navionics, I sailor or any sort of electronic uh, device that cruisers now they commonly use. Yeah, no, none of that. And the other big thing that you can't have is modern weather forecasting because I mean nowadays we would download uh, grip files uh, via satellite uh, to get weather forecasting, um, but you're not allowed that. You're allowed weather facts because weather facts existed back then. But there aren't many old-fashioned weather facts still around that print out synoptic charts on paper. So even to just try and locate that uh, retro equipment is a little bit tricky. And you're, of course, you're very limited. And that's uh, one of the big differences of this race to uh, one of the modern high-tech races. Is there's no weather routing. There's no one on the other side of the uh, phone telling you you should take this course because the weather system's coming up right. behind you. You're very limited in your communication. So, for example, I remember we used to, to rely on uh, downloading the satellite photos through SSB. You cannot do anything like that also. No, no, because that, that uh, modem SSB technology uh, post dates 1968. So the SSB existed uh, for, you know, long wave uh, communi long distance communication by voice. But you can't have a modem and any device that can download weather by SSB. And how are you with uh, celestial navigation? Because I heard you saying once to, that uh, this is not your biggest concern. How do you feel about relying on that sort of uh, um, tool? Or? I think it's going to be uh, a lot of fun. I've done quite a bit of celestial navigation, but I have never done it because I've relied on it. I've just done it because I had extra time out at sea and I felt like passing time and practicing with the sexton. So I can do it. And it was always fun to see, oh, okay, how close is my position to the GPS position? But this will be the first time that I actually completely and fully have to rely on it. And I'm actually really looking forward to it because it's going to be a fun challenge. And I'm kind of going uh, on what people tell me the old sailors you had to anyway rely on it they're saying look it's not the most difficult thing it's just a question of getting used to it and that it's actually hugely rewarding to be able to get your position uh, just based on celestial navigation so i am looking forward to you know getting my boat back in the water and getting sailing and seriously starting to practice it because of course i'm going to feel more confident when i get to practice it but it is not my biggest concern at this stage so I, I feel like, I feel I'm excited about it. You know? Which one is your biggest concern? If you can say one or two or whatever. Yeah, sure. I, I think the concerns will change um, as I get closer to the start line and certainly as I get onto the race. But right now, my biggest concern is um, getting my boat ready, uh, getting it really well prepared. And there are two factors with this. And one of them is time and the other one is money. And of course, the more money you have, the quicker you can get things done and the sooner you can order equipment and stuff. Um, and the less money you have, the more time it takes to get the things that you need. So um, this is really my biggest concern is uh, that I will be able to raise enough funds to actually see this project through right to the start line. And I'm very confident that I will, but this is one of my big stresses right now. So, so you're from Port Elizabeth in South Africa, right? You were born there. Yeah, yeah. I was born inland in South Africa, but I've I moved to the coast um, and I've been living there for, or based out of there for a very long time now. So, yeah. So now you're on another PE, but exactly opposite side of the Atlantic, right? Did you plan to be there before COVID hit? Was, was it your plan to be there doing what you're doing now or did you have to adapt? Um, it, it was a, it was kind of a backup plan. Um, I have a friend who has this house that I'm sitting in right now uh, on Prince Edward Island. And um, he's told me a lot about Prince Edward Island and how beautiful it is. So I really did always want to come here and, and see Prince Edward Island. And then 
I bought my boat in Newfoundland, which is quite close to Prince Edward Island. So when I said, hey, you know, my boat's uh, in Newfoundland and maybe when I go and uh, sail it out of there, I can stop in Prince Edward Island. And he said, yeah, sure. I mean, that would be really cool. So, um, so it was kind of a plan to come to Prince Edward Island. But initially, I thought I would sail from uh, Newfoundland to Maine and do the refit of my boat in Maine. And then when I realized it was becoming more and more impossible because by the time I got to my boat, it was already winter and winter up in Newfoundland is pretty harsh. It was getting very cold. Things were starting to freeze. Uh, the winter storms were uh, blowing past the Cabot Strait the whole time and along the coastline from Maine all along the Nova Scotia coast. And the other problem was that the U.S. borders were closed to non-essential uh, uh, sea travel. Mm -hmm. So I really had no um, chance to get back into Maine. And uh, the weather was getting pretty difficult to deal with, especially on a boat that had been standing on the hard for four years and that was having a few you know, problems and needed quite a bit of work. So it came quite easily to say, I'm going to go to uh, Prince Edward Island and this friend um, he, he doesn't live on Prince Edward Island, but he said the house is empty, so there's a place for you to stay. And he put me in touch with a group of very resourceful people that uh, managed to haul the boat out of the water and transport it with a lobster truck into a heated shed. And things could simply not have worked out better for me because I've got one of the best guys I could have ever wished for uh, working on this refit now with me. And awesome. I just, yeah. Sorry? So, and I say I didn't even know that he existed. So uh, chance and luck and circumstance have uh, worked in my favor. And I guess but sailors, uh, cruiser sailors, uh, solidarity is really awesome too. Like how, how people are able to, to help each other all the time. It's really special and unique, I guess. Yeah, you're very right there. Um, and in, in that sense, it becomes a very small world. And uh, I, I would not be where I am right now in my preparation if it hadn't been for so many people who've taken interest in the project and who've been willing to help me in, in so many different ways. So that, that is really cool. It really is a, a journey of friendship, you know. And Kirsten, about the race itself, how long are you imagining you're going to be on your own on this solo round the world trip? Do you imagine how many months or do you have any idea about that already? Yeah, I, I have a kind of an idea. I mean, it's very difficult to know what the outcome will be because, you know, uh, you're so limited in weather forecasting. So it's a, a great element of luck working in this race. But um, the last person who uh, won the race in the 2018 edition, he did it in about seven months, um, pretty much exactly on seven months. And... Uh, the route they sailed in the last edition was a little bit shorter than in the upcoming edition because we've got some additional photo gates uh, that they didn't have in that edition. So I think it's unlikely to beat the seven-month record, um, but I'm kind of hoping that it's going to be in the region of seven months because, of course, I'm participating in the race to try my very best to win. So I'm hoping it will be uh, you know, not much over seven months. But I was gonna, I'm, also, I'm also aware that it could be much longer than seven months. So. I was going to ask you if, uh, how you see the race, if you're one of those kind of people that just want to participate or you're going for win? Yeah, I'd, I'd really like to uh, go for the win. And I remember, remember having a, a conversation with a, a racing sailor and he said to me right in the beginning, why are you doing this? Are you doing it for the experience? Are you doing it to win? Because if you're doing it to win, uh, your preparation from the word go will be very different because if you're doing it for the experience, you could say, okay, here's a boat that's available at a price that I can afford. So I'll just buy that boat and it should be fine. Uh, but if you're doing it to win, you're going to say, I want that boat and no other boat. And if it's more expensive, I need to raise the funds to get that boat. So from the word go, uh, my preparation um, has been, I really want to do it to try my very best to win. So you're not at all thinking of doing something like uh, Montessier that started and just continued east toward uh, French Polynesia. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wouldn't consciously say I'm going to do a, a Montessier, but I know my nature, and that is once I'm out there sailing and really happy in my element, um, I, so I, I do have the tendency to just want to keep going. But I think it will be balanced out with the fact that I really want to win. <laughs> so, you know, I'll probably, I'll 
probably maybe if I was you know uh, not leading in the fleet and there was no hope of winning maybe I would do him what to say <laughs> but until that point I think my primary goal is going to be to try to win Awesome. And I was taking a look at the website of the Golden Globe race uh, information and the route and so on. I noticed among the, th there are 31 people, uh, skippers, uh, but uh, running, uh, select, uh, there are 31 who have uh, applied to, to participate. There is one question mark that doesn't show who that person is or where he or she is from. How do you feel knowing that so far at this stage you are the only woman who have applied for the race, Kirsten? Um, I, I guess it would be nice if there were other uh, females in the race. It, it would be a nice sort of company, but otherwise I don't think too much of the male-female aspect, to be honest, because uh, in my um, sailing career, I've very often been the only female skipper, so it kind of feels quite normal to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe the question mark person is a woman, and it's, I'm kind of curious to find out. Did but you see the question mark? I did, yeah. But basically, I, I just, I'm just happy to be in the race, and I'm happy. I, I just want to compete as an equal. I don't want to have any advantages over the guys just because I'm a woman or any preferential treatment. I, I just want to totally be out there with them as an equal because I don't really see in terms of the sailing what difference it makes whether you're male or female. You know. How long have you been a professional skipper, a professional sailor, Kirsten? When did it start in your life? I started my uh, sort of sailing career in about uh, 2006. Um, I just come from a, a trip cycling through Africa on my own from Morocco down to South Africa. And I got back to South Africa and I'm like, wow, that was an amazing trip. I kind of feel a little bit lost having finished the trip. So I need to take on my next dream. And my next dream was to uh, work at sea and to sail. And, uh, and that's really where I started. So since 2006, uh, one of my first uh, paid sailing jobs was um, working as a sailing instructor in East London, which is about 300 kilometers from Port Elizabeth uh, on the South African coast. And then I started doing deliveries on the South African coast. Um, and then eventually I went over to doing uh, international deliveries of delivering newly built catamarans that were built in South Africa. And then I went on to working for Skip Novak and, and so and things have just kind of evolved in the most positive kind of way for me ever since 2006, basically. And since you mentioned catamarans, about that dilemma of people preferring monohull rather than multi-hull, how do you feel about that? What is your preferences, if you have any? Yeah, well, um, initially, I always said, oh, I'm a monohull person, you know. Um, catamarans, they're probably more stable the wrong way around than they are the right way up. Um, but then the, the market was in catamarans, so the work was in catamarans, and I did 12 or more years of delivering catamarans, and I got to really like them and really enjoy them for the qualities that they have over a monohull. So, for example, uh, they're faster usually. Um, you've got a lot more space on a catamaran. You're usually sitting on the bridge of the catamaran and looking out, so as opposed <laughs> to one hour where you're often down below in the dark. Um, they've got two engines, so if one engine dies, you've still got a second engine. Uh, it's really easy to fly a spinnaker off a catamaran. Uh, you've got a lot of space on a catamaran. You've got that, that trampoline up front. You know, like when we did nice trade wind deliveries, you could go up front there and spend time there, do push-ups, sit-ups, whatever. You know, from that aspect, I really, really enjoyed the catamarans. And, we took some of those catamarans into the southern Indian Ocean into some really, really gnarly weather. And they wow. hold them, you know. I think you need to be more conservative when you're sailing catamarans. Um, but if you sail them properly and you take care of them, <laughs> that can be a hell of a lot of fun. But ultimately, um, if I really had to put my bet on a boat like like this Golden Globe race, I wouldn't want to do on a catamaran. I'm happy to be on, on a monarch, you know. They definitely their qualities it really depends on what you want to use them for you know, so. yeah you've just heard the first part of our chat if you enjoyed please feel free to share this one with your friends family and anyone you think might like it as well 
Don't forget to hit follow so you get notified when the next episode comes out. Make sure you have a look at the description of this episode where you can find all the links to help Kirsten out. Any kind of support is super welcome on her journey towards the Golden Globe race. I'll be back next week. Until then, stay healthy and safe wherever you are. Cheers. Cheers.